wild Padre series for the Marlins. They finally get a way to get it done, and it was in dramatic fashion. Kyle Stowers throwing one over the fence, but it was ruled a ground rule double. The Marlins get lucky on that one. Front office changes are afoot. Peter Bendix announcing multiple guys will not be extended beyond this year. Bendix continues to shake it up, and we start to get a view of what 25 and beyond looks like with AAA going crazy. Tons to get into. This is Locked on Marlins. You are Locked on Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings from England and welcome to Locked On Marlins, your daily Marlins pod. I am your host, Peter Pratt. Hit me up, of course, at Miami Marlins underscore UK. Happy Tuesday, guys. And it is a very happy greeting from me. I am currently on a British vacation. And so the, the background will look different. Uh, the lighting is not optimal. The sun is beaming in here, but frankly, the show must go on. Uh, thanks for making Lockdown Marlins your first listen of the day. This is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. And a reminder, there's also a YouTube channel. Hit subscribe over on the YouTube channel and join me in the comments. And let me know your thoughts, particularly on this slew of front office changes that are that are coming this offseason. Peter Bendix continuing to reshape the organization. Uh, and with that, there is collateral damage of good people that we have to call out. Probably uh, there's there's some value being delivered by those guys and historically. However, as with everything, Peter Bendix continues to shape it exactly to his specification. So we're going to talk about that as we get into uh, the show. No doubt we have to talk about this Padre series that was wild, wild. And it, it, it got... Super wild in the ninth inning uh, in game three. The Marlins were looking to avoid a sweep as well. So wild series, but also in the meantime, at exactly the same time, the AAA lineup was absolutely banging. All of a sudden, there's a degree of excitement coming here. Berger remains hot, but equally the AAA guys uh, recently acquired via trade, all sorts of different trades. Everyone hitting home runs on a single day has got everyone feeling particularly enthused. Uh, this episode is sponsored by our good friends over at FanDuel. You can make every moment more. And as playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone. Every day, all summer long, just visit FanDuel.com to get started. And guys, we are starting with the series that has just passed, the Padre series, and boy, oh boy, what a wild series it was. As I mentioned, probably the most uh, controversial or covered play of the whole series came in the ninth inning. Uh, the Marlins were ahead by one. The series, well, it was littered with bullpen issues with the Marlins, and they struggled to carry a lead, hold a lead, and particularly in extra innings as well. So some wild, wild games in this series. Fun to watch. I think that's the one other kind of observation here is even in mid-August, after the Marlins have traded away a ton of dudes, typically you see, you know, things start to trend down negatively. The, the on-field product is, is less than optimal, let's say. That's not the case with this Marlins team. They're scrapping and fighting and, you know, it's fun to watch. And, you know, they may not win, they may not lose, and frankly, the results... Don't really matter, but as a product to just consume there and then, it's fun. It's fun, no doubt. We get to this play in the in the ninth inning. Uh, the Padres were down by one. They were down to their final out. Kim blasts one into left field. Kyle Stowers goes up, tries to make the play. He misses it. The ball hits the top of the wall in front of uh, what was the Clevelander. So hits the top of the wall, bounces back, hits Stowers' glove. Stowers then effectively, inadvertently knocks it over the fence for a, what was then called a home run. So everyone's like, oh, my days. Craig Mish has got the yikes tweet out. It's all, like all hell's breaking loose. The Marlins have done it again. The bullpen once was a strength, now a weakness because, well, they've traded all the good guys away. Uh, but the umpires get together, they review it, and they realize that actually the ball was no longer in flight, seemingly is the rule. Everyone's learning the rules on the fly. 
The ball no longer in flight. It was actually coming back off the wall. No longer can be deemed a home run because it was then inadvertently knocked over the wall, but no longer in flight. So ruled a ground rule double. Let me know in the comments. Is this the first time you knew about this rule? I think it was for me. Just want to call out, by the way, in my opinion, that if the ball ends up over the fence, whether it is directly, whether a fielder has knocked it over, you know, any of those two combinations, if it's over the fence, for me, that's a home run. Like there's a boundary. And if the ball ends up over there, for me, that should be scored a home run. I don't actually know the, the historical reasons as to why that isn't the case. Maybe again, someone will know that situation. But for me, I found it very confusing. I think a lot of people watching the game found it confusing. We've all now learned together. I'm not convinced that's the right rule either. But nevertheless, the Marlins, they caught a break. Finally, they caught a break. And actually, the other main call, I mean, there's a few other main call outs from this series, but the other one, and I called it out in advance of the series, I, I want to see Max Meyer and I want to see Edward Cabrera. I want to see those two guys specifically. What can these guys deliver? Because these guys are, you know, the bona fide starters that the Marlins will be thinking about headed into next year. They, they've service time manipulated Max Meyer, so they obviously believe in Max. But clearly, it's been a bit of a struggle for him since coming back up. So I was closely watching these guys. Max Meyer ends up going six and a third. So fair play to Max uh, going six and a third. That was only 91 pitches as well. So, you know, he was efficient. He was efficient with, with what, he, what he worked with. So six and a third, impressive. He came out for the seventh, obviously. Um, some on Twitter were like, oh, why are we bringing Max out? I mean, just... So I'm just going to let him roll and just see how far he can go. But ends up with four runs, uh, all earned, seven hits, four Ks for Max Meyer. Um, so for me, the main thing here is the depth into the game. This is it from a Marlins perspective. And we saw this with Eddie Cabrera in game one. We'll talk about him shortly. But for Max Meyer, you know, we need to start seeing, and just generally for the Marlins rotation, we need to start seeing six plus more frequently. There's too many three, four inning extravaganzas. The bullpen, you know, is, is being asked to do way too much because they just can't get any length out of their starters. So, you know, I'm interested to see how Skip manages the, the rotation the rest of the way. There could be a few Ivan Drago situations where the guys are just left out there because it's needs must. The game may get away from them, but it's needs must because there's no one left in the pen to throw any innings. They've been asked to do way too much. But encouraging. From Max Meyer is how I would describe it. Definitely encouraging in terms of the, the box score. And if you look at six and the third, you're encouraged. Um, you know, the other, I guess the other aspect too, zero walks, by the way, from Max Meyer. Zero walks, four Ks. So the four Ks fell a little bit down, but nevertheless, you know, encouraging. Let's go back then to uh, Friday evening's game of which the Marlins had the game in control, fully in control. Edward Cabrera. Uh, with a stunner of an outing, seven innings, four hits, just three walks and four Ks uh, for Eddie Cabrera. So, you know, for me, that's what we need to see more often from Eddie. Uh, 106 pitches in total. With Eddie Cabrera, I think what we've seen has been the most recent starts. It, it feels like he's in that, you know, the, the situation we see where he's in that groove, starts to find his groove, starts to find his consistency a little bit more frequently. I'd say definitely the last month. Or so Cabrera has definitely been uh, back to what we what we expect and kind of proving himself, proving himself that this is a legitimate big league starter. Uh, let's let's do a you know a mid August check in on the ERA. Cabrera's ERA now down to five point two. Feels okay. It's pretty much the same as Max Myers, but you know early in the year it was like an eight ERA or something crazy. It's down to 5.2. It's trending in the right direction, but seven innings, four hits, no runs, obviously. Three walks, four Ks. You know, this is the Eddie Cabrera that we need to see. And looking ahead to next year, we're going to need to see. I, You know, it feels to me like Sandy's going to be back. We'll see how the year goes. And I want to talk about that you know, in a third segment here, just looking ahead a touch. But, you know, for Eddie Cabrera, there is still a role in this rotation. For Max Meyer, there's still a role in this rotation, clearly. So that's two of the five that you hope to be, you know, throwing meaningful innings for the Marlins uh, through the through the year. Sandy Alcantara, another one. 
I, I do have my suspicions over Yuri Perez that have been well documented in this uh, via this podcast that I'm not convinced that Yuri will throw any major league innings in, in 2025 unless, and the only unless to that, the only caveat to that is if the Marlins somehow are alive and they're bang live in the campaign. They have a 2023 resurgence. And if that's the case, then you get it, then you get Yuri Perez back. But gut feel is Lozada will be moved at some point, maybe Sandy also. Then you're kind of thinking, okay, is there a need to rush back Yuri Perez during this campaign? That's the questions. But nevertheless, for Edward Cabrera, for Max Meyer, those two guys in particular, you know, I'm closely watching what they're doing right now because this it this is an indicator of what the future can hold. And I think what from a Marlins organization perspective is they need to ask themselves, can you trust Eddie Cabrera? Can you trust Max Meyer? They've obviously looked to move Eddie Cabrera historically. I mean, maybe they go back to that again. But I spoke about it last offseason. I was surprised that they were looking to move Eddie Cabrera because the upside, upside has always remained. It's always felt like it's there. For whatever reason, injuries, mental lapses, whatever it might be, consistency. Never quite found that with Eddie. But maybe the rest of the campaign now, what, six weeks left to go? You know, six, seven starts remaining for Eddie. You know, can we can we get this level of consistency from him the rest of the way out? Six innings every time. Bang, 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 bang. That's what we need to see from Eddie. And if so, then the Marlins really have something on their hands, either for themselves or as a significant trade asset. Want to talk about the front office changes Straight after the first ad, so stick with us on that one. Uh, Craig Mish with an article in the Herald talking about some changes that are afoot in the front office. Uh, who is going and equally who is certainly safe and have some thoughts on Gabe Kapler specifically about what his role may be for the Marlins in 2025. Uh, so before we do that, let's firstly let you know about our good friends over at Ibotta. Yes, sir. And guys, Ibotta is a free app that lets you earn cash back every time you shop. Sounds amazing, right? Earn on hundreds of items from groceries, beauty supplies, even toys. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. The average Ibotta user earns $256 per year. That could cover the cost of an entire shopping trip, that flight you've been eyeing, or the fancy dinner you've been craving. Other apps give you points that frankly don't amount to much. With Ibotta, you earn cash back that you can withdraw to your bank account. PayPal or gift cards, simply add offers in the app, upload your receipts, and voila, the money is yours. You can save over, you can save on over 2,400 brands and shop at over 1,000 retailers, including your favorite grocery stores, Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy, and more. It's time you joined the over 50 million users who use Ibotta to earn cash back every time they shop. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the code LOCKEDONMLB when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app and start earning cash back and use the code LOCKEDONMLB. Reminder, that is $5 to you just for trying the Ibotta app. Stunning, that promo code again, LOCKEDONMLB. Ibotta is spelled I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Player App Store. And that code, again, locked on, MLB. And this episode is also brought to you by our good friends over at FanDuel. Yes, sir. Guys, I love sports and I love them so much. I never want them to stop. My wife can testify to this. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sporting like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone all day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, guys, welcome back to Locked on Marlins on Tuesday, the 13th of August. Yes, a new location for me, a new background. I'm effectively on vacation this week, guys, but the show must go on. My wife isn't happy with this situation. My son, ah, he's he's okay with it. He's listening. He's playing on his iPad this morning. But nevertheless, we're hitting the beach real soon. We've got a heat wave here in the UK. Uh, this is a two-day heat wave. This is probably our summer, so I'm maximizing it on some UK sandy beaches. 
Um, in the meantime, the show rolls on, and there's been a lot going on. Already mentioned, the Padre series was wild. Just to finish up on that one, by the way, Jake Berger is playing out of his mind, and I, I think it's fair to say that Jake Berger's wife, I think he said, said post game, or Jake Berger said post game, she texted him to say, "Are you even real right now?" Um, brings me back and reminds me of that 2023 uh, meme. Uh, you know, insert that, uh, et cetera, et cetera, with Berger. But he is on fire, Maguire at this point, unreal from Berger. You know, the second half, but we saw him last year when he when he joined the Marlins via trade. But it was obviously a, a decent start to the year, contact-wise. Power was down, got hurt, struggled to get back going. But this has been unreal from Berger. And he he looks like a real piece. I called it out on Twitter to say, this Jake Berger is the best third baseman the Marlins had, have had in any time that I've watched the Marlins. So that dates back to 2016. He's, better, he's the best third, third baseman the Marlins have had in that period. There's going to be others from back in the day, so to speak. But... The Marlins have really hit on something here with Jake Berger. They really have. In terms of offensive production, he is he's the prototype. He is the stereotypical guy that you need at third base. Then the Marlins need at the corners, both infield and outfield. And I think when we when we're going to talk about the, the double A lineup and, and who's sitting there and who can come and what impact they can make, I think it's very interesting that the power guys, you know, we're going to see some power guys, but we're going to see them in prototypical or stereotypical roles. At the corners, first base, third base, left field, right field. Obviously, the DH spot as well. So, yeah, just to call out Jake Berger, he's playing absolutely out of his mind. Uh, also wanted to call out as well from that series, Lewis Arias, great to see him again. Um, impact stick, had some impact knocks for the Padres uh, in multiple games. So, you know, whilst Lewis Arias is not hitting anywhere near 400 at this point, and there's talk about him being non-tendered this offseason. Actually, let me just talk about that briefly. I, I know I know that that rumor has circulated and a lot of people are using that. Um, I've not heard anyone from the Padres organization um, talk about that. I've not heard any Padres fans specifically um, talking about the, the scenario that Luis Arias may be non-tendered um, by the Padres. I appreciate that the number overall will be relatively high. But considering... The what they you know what they moved to acquire Luis Arias. I, I just I just don't believe that they will go down that pathway. We've seen that Luis Arias impacts the game. We saw it firsthand in this series. We've seen it firsthand from a Marlins fan perspective last season. Luis Arias he's not he's he's one in his own at this point. But there's extreme value in that. Yes, it doesn't show up on various metrics, etc. But fundamentally, baseball is from an offensive standpoint about getting hits and there's no better in the game than getting hits than Luis Arias. I fully expect him to be um to go into arbitration or to reach a deal with the Padres and maybe that's it. Maybe this is the situation where there's like a a pre-arb um you know deal that they do and avoid arbitration. I, it wouldn't shock me if that's the pathway it goes with the Arias but you know I know that Marlins fans have talked about him being non-tendered particularly if he hits under 300 but He's playing hurt at this point. He's an absolute stud. They've moved significant numbers of prospects to acquire Luis Arias. And so for me, it doesn't make any sense that the Padres would look to move on because he gets maybe $5 million more expensive next year. It's still the same Luis Arias, still the same guy that they identified that they loved and they felt had a huge impact. And listen, look at the Padres offense right now. The, the Padres themselves are, have been absolutely rolling. Arias has got a torn ligament, but he's playing through that. Team man, of course. But Arias is playing through that. The offense is humming. Look at last year. The offense was not humming in the way it, it has been this year. Look at the Marlins last year. The offense was humming at times. Um, and Arias is a big part of that. So as much as you point to, you know, hey, the war's not great. The defensive metrics aren't great. He can't run, except fine, I get it. But he hits baseballs better than anyone in the game. And for me, there's a significant value to that. I think the Padres continue. Um, to benefit from that into next season. Let me know your thoughts on that one. Um, it feels like a rumor that has been created by the Marlins fans um, or media. I've not heard that from anyone else. So I'm interested to get your sense on that. Let's hit the final ad. I want to talk about the front office changes. We may run out of time here looking ahead to the, the AAA lineup, but we'll briefly touch on it. Uh, probably do another bigger, deeper episode on that one uh, later in the week. Okay, so uh, let's firstly let you know about our good friends over at Supply. House. 
and you can get supplies from the site that's made for the skill trade, supplyhouse.com. Supplyhouse.com is the reliable way to order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical products online. Their easy-to-use website is packed with helpful resources and the latest product info to help you get the job done right. Shop a complete inventory of over 200,000 parts from over 400 top brands and get your order delivered right to your door with fast shipping from coast to coast. Need help with an order? No problem. Get expert support and industry-leading service from the friendliest folks in the business. Talk to a real person every time. Pros in the skilled trades can get a competitive edge by joining supplyhouse.com's free Trade Master program. Every Trade Master gets access to a dedicated phone line, free shipping and discounts on every order. Join the thousands of trade pros already benefiting from their free membership at supplyhouse.com slash TM and order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical supplies from anywhere with just a few clicks at supplyhouse.com. Welcome back to Locked on Marlins with me, Peter Pratt. It is Tuesday, the 13th of August. This is coming at you from a part of England. It's a county in England called Norfolk. Go and look it up. We're headed to Great Yarmouth today. Uh, the sun should be baking down. So go and hit the geography lesson up. But there is a California in Norfolk specifically. So yes, the UK has a California. Uh, I believe it's it's a town <laughs> relatively nearby to here. You see my geography is a bit patchy, but nevertheless, um, coming at you from Norfolk, not from Leeds, the usual space. And we're still talking Marlins baseball, of course. Let's talk about the front office changes that have been announced headed into next season. So this is not immediate firings or anything like that. But Craig Mish with an article uh, with Barry Jackson, actually, uh, via the Heralds, uh, that they will part ways with two executives hired by former regimes. Firstly, Marlins assistant GM Dan Greenlee and also Oz uh, Ocampo, both told that their contracts will not be renewed when they expire this season. So Peter Bendix continues to reshape things. Oz Ocampo, I think in particular for me, um, not, not a surprise. I mean, nothing's a surprise with Peter Bendix, and I completely get it. These guys were hired by previous regimes. They've added value to the organization, et cetera, et cetera. Hence why they're still there. But no surprises that Bendix looks to go in slightly different directions. We saw, I mean, the offseason, they made zero moves on the field, but off the field. Boy, oh boy, it was just, you know, activity levels were so high. And, and you know, Bendix bringing in tons of different guys, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, Oza Campo, I think, is an interesting one in, in particular because Kim Ang hired him. Um, and he became, you know, almost the kind of right hand man in many ways, Oza Campo, uh, while Kim Ang was still there anyway, according to Craig Mish, it seems. So, um, you know, that's an interesting one. I think the other headline from this, um, from this article in particular was the fact that Gabe Kapler expected to remain in the organization, which, I mean, considering he was hired by Bendix makes sense, but also not to transition into a managerial position, which a lot of rumors being circulated. Obviously, Skip Schumacher will be likely leaving the organization at the end of 24. He's a free agent uh, now that he's had his um, team option removed. So, that then opens up the managerial position. Many making the connections. Okay, Gabe Kapler's in the organization. He's been a manager before. Um, could he be the guy that steps into this role? My gut feel on Gabe Kapler is that he becomes the Marlins' general manager this offseason. That is my gut feel for Gabe Kapler, um, that he moves into that role, becomes a GM, and the Marlins then hire um, someone externally um, for uh, from the managerial position. We'll be talking about that. Much later on, uh, as we get into the, you know, near the offseason, et cetera, about who the candidates could be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and clearly, at this point, Skip Schumacher still be could be one of them guys. Um, but most likely, Skip and the Marlins uh, will, will likely move on from each other, which, again, links to it with Peter Bendix, you know, going in different direction uh, more generally, bringing in his guys, his people, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that seems to be the way. There's going to be people that, you know, are moved on from the organization. They, you know, they've been part of the organization for, you know, maybe many years. Like Dan Greenlee's been around seven, eight years now. Um, Oza Campo, um, less so. Um, but a lot of these guys were brought in during, you know, more recently anyway, by, via Kim Ang and, uh, you know, when she was around. So no surprise to see it, you know, it happen. You know, 
the Marlins have made so many moves in the front office that uh, it doesn't. Yeah, they probably don't need this this amount of GMs and assistant GMs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's probably a little bit um, inflated. So the high level on this one is Ben Nix has made the call. They're going in some slightly different directions with some slightly different personnel, which makes total sense. My gut feel is Gabe Kapler will be the GM headed into next season. And it's probably a good thing. Like Peter Bennix at this point is effectively, you know, covering both roles, um, president of baseball ops and general manager at this point. And it's time to to bring in some help um, in that GM role. I think Kapler could be that guy. Let's just finish up very briefly and talk about the, the AAA lineup because listen, a lot of people are getting excited in terms of following Marlins baseball, looking at the minor leagues at this point. And that makes total sense because they've made a, a slew of trades. There's a lot of new guys in the organization and naturally our eyeballs are considering who is good, who could be a part of the future, um, what sexy narratives can we create, whatever it might be. One thing to call out is one prospect that has been acquired by a trade and has gone straight to the big league level in Kyle Stowers has struggled mightily. And so we have to call that out. But a lot of the guys that have been acquired and gone to the minor leagues have hit the ground running very much so, which is encouraging. The only caveat I would call out at this point is the level, and, and a lot of these guys, it's primarily linked to the hitters. You have to question from a pitching perspective in terms of the level of competition these guys are facing at this point, how far the gap must be from big league to AAA or AA at this point of the season. My gut feel is that it's pretty sizable only because we see the level of guys that are promoted from AAA within the Marlins organization. They come up to the big league level and it's pretty clear that they're not really at that level. So that's the only caveat I would say. Overall, I'm all in on buying in these guys and buying into their numbers for sure. Um, Jared Cerner has obviously been the standout guy in terms of his production. He just keeps hitting doubles every day. Every day, Jared Cerner just going bananas. But we had a situation uh, in, in in AAA on Sunday, uh, no game on Monday. So Sunday, we had a situation where it was, you know, all of the big guys in the trades recently all going yard with uh, Davison De Los Santos, Augustin de Ramirez, and Connor Norby, the three of them all hitting sizable home runs. Augustin Ramirez, in recent games, I would say, last week in particular, had one hell of a week, just hit balls hard all the time. Super encouraging. So all of a sudden, and we're going to dig into this in more depth in, in you know future episodes, of course, all of a sudden you start to consider what the 25 lineup could look like for the Marlins here, considering you've got Augustin Ramirez, you plug him in a catcher, Davison De Los Santos, you plug him in at first base. We've already talked about Jake Berger at the corner, you know, at the third base as well. So Berger, uh, De Los Santos, Ramirez, you've got Xavier Edwards just locked into shortstop. Second base is up for debate in the, like, Connor Norby. Is it going to be Jared Cerna? You know, we'll wait and see, but one of those two guys could absolutely be starting second base for the Marlins heading into 25. You then head to the outfield. Jesus Sanchez likely to be locked in at right field, particularly against right-handed pitching. Center field is interesting, but the one wild card, and there's a Marlins UK group chat going on at the moment. And one of the, one of the names we spoke about within that group chat recently was um, uh, Javier Sanoha, who has just been unreal in terms of the lack of strikeouts and the production been playing a lot up the middle. From what we look at the Marlins organization right now, Sonoha looks pretty much ready. It's fair to say he's young, but he looks ready. He looks like he might be earning himself an opportunity. And that opportunity, considering the move with Jazz Chisholm Jr. being traded by the Marlins, could well come at center field, which all of a sudden becomes a very enticing proposition. We'll look to see what happens to left field. Carl Stowers, let's hope that he can find something. But at this point, Stowers looks overmatched thus far in his Marlins career. Um, obviously, a little bit of a tough transition for him going from a uh, a lively, you know, in-the-hunt team with the Orioles to the Marlins, which are in the absolute opposite situation. Maybe there's a little bit too much pressure he's putting on himself. I don't know. But, you know, you start to piece this together and you start to think, what could 25 look like from an offensive standpoint? How quickly could these guys get here? Ramirez a catcher. De Los Santos at first. Let's just say Conor Norby at second. Xavier Edwards at short, Berger at third, 
Stowers at left, Sonoa in center, Jesus Sanchez in right field, someone rotating in the DH spot. Man, oh man, this lineup could be one of the youngest, one of the uh, probably has the least amount of service time going in all of Major League Baseball headed into next year. And then you think about what the rotation could look like. You start to then think this could be a fun group to watch. Whether they're competitive is another question, but it could be a fun group. And I think the Marlins need to put a fun group on the field for 25, no doubt about it. Guys, we're long. It's out of time. We're going to wrap it up there. Firstly, I hope the Wi-Fi has held up. So this uh, has come through loud and clear. Um, I'll be back later in the week covering, well, a bit of the Philly series, any breaking news that happens um, uh, as we go along. So stick with me. Uh, it's a little bit patchy this week in terms of coverage and times for dropping as effectively I'm on vacation and uh, I can only do so much. But look forward to seeing you guys real soon. See you then.